Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Rusin, for that very kind and uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I hope you won't hold the MBA against me. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here and, and tell you a little bit about some of the, uh, the systems that we're developing in the VIS and, and kind of give you an overview of where we think uh, this field is heading. So uh, I'm part of a platform called Biomimetic Microsystems, and as you can probably tell, there's very, lots of different names for basically the same thing, tissue chip, organs on chips. Um, and basically, biomimetic microsystems are organs on chips. And the idea is to use engineering techniques developed by the computer uh, industry, uh, microchip industry, uh, such as photolithography, to um, build small devices containing human living cells uh, that constitute, reconstitute organ level function. Um, and the reason I've really highlighted in orange here organ level function is that we're not trying to recreate in situ a 3D organ. We're not trying to recreate a heart or a liver. We're trying to identify those key attributes of that specific organ physiology and use the simplest system possible to recreate that. And if we need to add back complexity, we can always back, uh, add in things later on. An idea is to use these things for things uh, such as drug screening, diagnostic purposes, toxicology, therapeutic applications, and looking at uh, environmental uh, health issues. And the idea is to hopefully someday accelerate drug development and at least in the near term, refine and reduce the use of animals and hopefully in the future, uh, replace animal testing. So uh, Don Ingber is the uh, founding director of the Wies Institute, um, and he is also the head of this platform. And uh, some of the other key faculty that we have working on this project are Kit Parker, George Whitesides, uh, Ali Kadamasani, and uh, Dave Waits. So I wanted to just kind of take a, a, a small step backward and, and just kind of define the issue. So what is the underlying challenge of developing these microsystems? Um, and one is to uh, replicate human organ level function uh, in vitro. And what defines an organ? And there's probably a lot of different definitions, as Dr. Rusin probably put out there. Um, but for uh, our uh, pur purposes of our discussion today, um, they're composed of two or more tissues uh, that exhibit unique functions when they're interfaced together. So they both have individual functions, and they also have very unique functions when they're actually put together. Uh, as you know, we're vascularized. We all have blood vessels in our body, so they're perfused by blood flowing through endothelium lined vessels. Uh, they're controlled by chemical and molecular factors and cues that are either produced by those constituent cells or that are delivered through the vasculature to those tissues and organs. And a key aspect here that uh, I'll highlight in my talk is that they're regulated by mechanical forces. And this is something that's not typically found in uh, normal in vitro cultures. And that's due to motion, and as you can imagine, the lung, breathing motion in our gut, peristalsis, and through the blood flow causing shear and through the tissues. Uh, they're also structured in very specific ways to secrete or transport factors in very specific uh, directions. So there is uh, a, a directionality and a specificity implied by that. Uh, they can be infiltrated by immune cells uh, during an inflammatory response. And I'll show you, highlight an aspect of that in, in my talk also. And, and lastly, they're physiologically coupled to other organs uh, via factors that are either transmitted in blood, that are through the blood flow linking the, the, through the linking vessels. And uh, we've just started to make steps now uh, in our group at the VIS, um, and I think in other groups also, in linking these together to form more uh, uh, coupled organ systems uh, and hopefully someday move more towards a human uh, kind of organ on a chip. So what do you use the, the microengineering techniques to do? So again, I said we can use photolithography. It's the same thing that makes little microchip systems in, in your computers. Uh, one is to recreate that tissue-tissue interface. Uh, and by doing that, we can oppose two tissues, uh, an epithelial cell and a vascular, uh, and a vascular uh, tissue, look at transport, absorption across that, permeability, conductivity. And again, as I mentioned, uh, we can provide mechanical cues. We can apply stretch. We can apply flow. Um, so we can look at cyclic mechanical strain, the air-liquid interface, which is very important for your lungs, and directional, cl and, uh, directional clearance. And again, by uh, the ability to uh, exactly orient the cells, we can also take advantage of uh, the systems and use high-resolution real-time imaging to do kind of fluorometric analysis, so real-time analysis of what's going on molecularly in these cells. We can place the cells in separate chambers, and that allows us now to, to uh, sample the fluid going through one side or the other side, through the vascular compartment or through the parenchymal cell compartment, and actually uh, sample those and analyze those. 
as well as also separate the cells themselves. One of the things that's a real disadvantage for 3D organoid systems is all the cells are together, and trying to separate the, the genetic signature of what the response is from that can be very difficult. Here we actually have a physical separation. We can do that much more easily. Uh, again, I mentioned so these, uh, we can use flow, so we can have fluid flow through channels. Uh, and that can support long-term culture, which is another key difference from uh, some of the uh, TD uh, cultures that are uh, occurring, uh, you know, uh, right now. Um, we can uh, culture, I think, in some of our systems uh, for up to two months. Uh, we could potentially go even longer than that. Uh, we've just terminated to actually get an endpoint in the assay. So now you can see that you can start to do chronic exposure testing as well as acute exposure testing of environmental toxins or pharmaceutical drugs. We can look at uh, pharmacokinetic analysis, uh, clearance, and uptake. Uh, it also permits co-culture of the microbiome, which has been shown to be very important in the last several years for both pathophysiology path path as well as normal physiology uh, of organs and of the humans. And I'll show you an example of that in my talk. And we can also create endothelialized vascular cells and vascular channels. Uh, and again, so now we can circulate uh, immune cells through those vascular channels and look at recruitment and the inflammatory response. Um, we could potentially use blood and plasma in the future to perfuse our organ systems. Uh, and also, using this kind of vascular network, we can also physiologically couple uh, different organ systems together. So the rest of my talk will really be giving you kind of examples uh, of each one of these points and show how we've... Uh, tackle that in engineering as well as uh, biological uh, challenges to create these organs on chips. So really the proof of concept uh, came in 2010 uh, by a paper by Dan Ha, uh, who was a postdoc in Don Ingber's lab, uh, a human breathing lung on a chip, and it was published in Science in 2010. So the uh, purpose of the paper is to actually to recreate the alveolus. Uh, which is a simple structure within the lung, but it's the key functional unit of the lung. It's where gas exchange occurs. It's where metastases of cancers occurs. It's where drug absorption occurs uh, when you deliver uh, drugs in pharmaceutical industry. It's a relatively simple structure. Uh, you have the uh, alveolar, let me get my, there we go. Uh, the alveolar air sac space here. You have a epithelial uh, alveolar layer an extracellular matrix, this is permeable and flexible. You have your vascular endothelial cell layer, and then your blood compartment. So this is the tissue-tissue interface that we wanted to recreate. And as you can see, the lung breathes. So with every expiration and inspiration that we have, those alveolar sacs are being stretched and, and allowed to relax. So the mechanical motion is you know, very critical to the normal physiology and pathophysiology of the lung as well as blood flow, so we can also put uh, vascular channels in there to actually recreate the blood flow through the lung. This is the uh, lung on a chip. It's made out of PDMS, which is basically a silicon rubber. It's clear. Uh, it's optically clear, so we can do high-resolution microscopy. Uh, it's biocompatible, uh, so we can grow cells. And it's flexible, so we can actually do mechanical activation using the system. And it's also uh, easily moldable. It's uh, kind of the, the standard, the gold standard for uh, prototyping instruments for organs on chips or micro devices for organs on chips. This is a little movie that just kind of gives you a uh, schematic of what the, the structure is. There's basically three channels. Uh, the middle channel is split into two with a, por uh, a, a porous, uh, thin PDMS layer. It's got lots of holes in it, uh, 7 to 10 micron in diameter, so we can get interaction and communication between the top and the bottle channel. We can grow lung cells in the top channel and the vascular endothelial cells on the bottom channel. And we can initially perfuse through the top and the bottom and go to air-liquid interface in the top channel when necessary. And then you can see the side channels uh, are connected very thin walls to that central channel. And when you apply vacuum, you can actually stretch that middle membrane and apply the normal physiological breathing motion that you'd see. We've used both. So we've used uh, A549 and H441 cells initially, and then now we've moved towards uh, human primary uh, alveolar cells. And uh, they both work equally well. This is what the cells look like in culture. So we form nice uh, monolayers on both the epithelial side and the endothelial side. Nice tight junctions uh, as uh, evidenced by the occludin staining in the uh, epithelial side as well as the uh, VE cadhedron on the endothelial side, and the stretch uh, does not disrupt the cells. 
And so one of the first key higher level functions that Dan wanted to demonstrate in this chip was lung inflammation response. And I'll just go through that very quickly here. So basically, if you have a pathogen, uh, a bacteria that comes into your lungs, uh, it act interacts with your uh, lung alveo alveolar epithelial cells. Those cells uh, secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. Those cytokines are transported across that endothelial cell or the uh, uh, extracellular matrix layer and uh, go to your endothelial uh, 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 endothelial layer, basically your vascular cells, and you get uh, uh, endothelial activation, the vascular cell uh, activation. And this uh, increases uh, regula uh, upregulation of ICAM-1. The circulating leukocytes actually then attach to the ICAM-1. Uh, then they diapodese and transmigrate across both cell layers, infiltrate into the alveoli, and engulf your bacteria. Could we recreate that in our lung on a chip? And so to do that, uh, Dan either uh, put the pro-inflammatory cytokine in the upper alveolar layer or E. coli bacteria. And then we were able to perfuse, since we have the vascular channel in the, on the endothelial side, what, uh, white blood cells. So these are freshly isolated white blood cells. And I'll show you in the, in the next set of movies, uh, you won't see the cell layers because they're not stained. Uh, the neutrophils are actually stained fluorescently, so you can actually see the, the, the neutrophils. And in the normal condition with a non-inflamed endothelial layer, our neutrophils are just <laughs> flowing by. And if you add either uh, TNF-alpha or E. coli bacteria, you can see that the neutrophils now with the ICAM-1 upregulation stick rapidly to the vascular endothelial cells. And now using the high-resolution microscopy, you can see that a single uh, neutrophil comes, adheres, travels around, looks for a space between two cells, finds that hole between the membranes, the PDMS membranes, and then comes through on the other side. And in this last panel, the uh, neutrophils are stained in red and the E. coli bacteria are stained in green. And you see once they get to the other side, they engulf the E. coli bacteria. And so in this simple si little system, this plastic little system, I've shown you that we can recreate the whole human inflammatory response. In uh, 2010, Dan wanted to extend the model and see if he could mimic a human disease, and he chose chemotherapy-induced pulmonary edema. So IL-2 is a chemotherapeutic agent. It's often used for a melanoma or a kidney cancer. Uh, one disadvantage is that an adverse side effect is vascular leakage syndrome, and that manifests itself in the uh, lungs as pulmonary edema. And basically, that's fluid buildup in the alveolar sac, as well as post-mortem you can see on, on autopsy these fibrin clot formations within the alveolus. So to do that, uh, Dan uh, perfused IL-2, clinically relevant concentrations of IL-2 through the uh, lung on a chip. And here you can see this is a top-down view looking down on top of the alveolar epithelial layer of the chip. It looks fuzzy because you're uh, imaging through that uh, air interface. And if you add the IL-2 over the course of several days, what you see is fluid transport now occurring from the vascular endothelial channel up into the alveolar epithelial cha uh, chamber. And that starts off by formation of a meniscus on the sides, and then this chamber slowly fills over the course of several days, where by day four, the top channel is completely filled with fluid. And as in comparison here, you can see this is a much crisper image, and that's because now you're uh, imaging through that uh, fluid layer now instead of the, uh, the air layer. And interestingly enough, that time course of four days is uh, roughly what it takes for a patient that's going to uh, exhibit this adverse effect to develop it uh, in the clinic or in therapy. So could we also mimic the fibrin clot formation uh, within the alveolar space? So in this case, uh, Dan, in addition to the uh, IL-2 uh, perfused with uh, members of the uh, coagulation cascade, in this case prothrombin and a fluorescently labeled fibrinogen, and so you can see in this video, uh, hopefully you can see it, uh, the fibrinogen uh, fluorescent label is just kind of flowing by. And then with the addition of the IL-2 over the course of several days, you actually start to see clot formation within the chip. And if you do uh, high f or, uh, confocal microscopy, you can actually see that it's forming exactly what you expect on the alveolar uh, epithelial layer uh, in the chip. Another way to... Uh, uh, measure permeability uh, within the chip is to use a uh, marker such as uh, inulin. Uh, it's a large macromolecule, so it shouldn't pass uh, through the cell layer if there's an intact barrier present. Uh, it's often used in renal studies to look at water transport. 
In this case, uh, we labeled uh, inulin with FITC, so fluorescent labels so you can easily track it. Uh, and as you can see, just as I said, with uh, control or with uh, applying just normal physiological levels of breathing strain, 10 percent, there's no uh, change in the permeability barrier. If you add the IL-2 alone uh, with no strain, you get a slight increase in the permeability, so there is uh, a change in the barrier function. But what's most dramatic is now if you add the breathing motion on top of that, you see a dramatic increase in the um, uh, change in the permeability barrier. And so this is something you would not have seen in a static in vitro culture. So again, uh, utilizing the uh, high-resolution microscopy, we can actually go in and interrogate what's causing that permeability change. And what appears to be happening is that there is uh, gaps forming between the cells, both in the epithelial side as well as the endothelial side. And we can quantify those, so there's actually an increase in the number of gaps as well as the size of the gaps that occurs with IL-2 application. One of the things we always strive to do is uh, make sure that our uh, responses are uh, physiologically relevant. So Ben Matthews over at Children's Hospital has a isolated perfused mouse model uh, where you can actually independently ventilate or perfuse the model as well as uh, deliver aerosols to the model. And so uh, by uh, comparing our uh, responses in the lung on a chip with that whole lung model, you can see that they're virtually identical. And so that gave us very good confidence that our uh, model was uh, recreating a physiologically relevant response. In conjunction with uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, we actually did a test to see if we could do a pharmacological modulation of the response. So they were developing a TRPB4 inhibitor, which is a uh, mechanosensitive ion channel, uh, which is, increases uh, uh, permeability to calcium upon stretch. Uh, they were developing it for uh, heart failure-induced pulmonary edema, and they wanted to see if it was actually uh, effective in this model. And as you can see, with the application of the TRPB4, uh, the IL-2 response was completely uh, blocked. And so based on this result, uh, GSK actually increased uh, the funding uh, to that project by threefold, and so we had a direct impact uh, on a pharmacological uh, company as well as a product. And so for the remainder uh, of my talk, I'd, I'd like to uh, just give you a quick overview of two other chips that are organ systems that we're developing, the gut on a chip and the bone marrow on a chip. Uh, we'll show, illustrate uh, various points, again, of the, the key aspects of uh, organ physiology that we're trying to recreate. So the uh, gut on a chip uh, was uh, developed by Hyunyoung Kim uh, in Don's lab, uh, published in 2012 and uh, 2013. It uses the base, uh, basically the same platform that a lung on a chip de uh, device does, uh, two side channels to apply the uh, peristaltic motion. So again, in this case, instead of the, the more rapid uh, breathing motion, we're using slow peristaltic motion uh, delivered like we see when transport in the gut. Uh, again, we can apply flow uh, through the top channel and the bottom channel, and we can apply those flows at independent rates. So we can apply an appropriate vascular flow as well as a slow kind of trickling flow that you'd normally see is with movement through your gut. Uh, again, the, the, the uh, vessel si the chamber sizes are slightly different from the lung on a chip to accommodate the different cell types and the physiology. And as you can see, the monolayer uh, forms and you get nice uh, uh, monolayer formation and uh, you can deform uh, using that cyclic motion uh, using the side channels. Uh, one of the key differences is uh, the time it takes to actually fully differentiate the cells. So in a normal transwall culture, uh, this is kind of this uh, gold standard used in pharmaceutical industry. It takes about 21 days to get a decent um, transepithelial barrier forming here uh, with good tight, uh, actually not tight junctions, but good junction formation. Uh, within the gut on a chip, using that trickling flow and the peristaltic stretch, within three days uh, we get much better function uh, and structure uh, in this chip. So even after 21 days, you can see that the KCO2 cells in the, the gut on, or in the uh, trans wall are relatively flat, epithelial-like, lack polarity, whereas in the um, gut on the chip, they're much taller. They look much more like the uh, gut epithelial cell uh, morphology and actually uh, more well polarized. Um, Initially, uh, going back to a question that uh, came up earlier, we used KCO2 cells, which is a cancer cell line. Uh, it's uh, used as a gold standard in industry. It's not the best cell line, uh, but it's uh, the only one that, uh, say, the pharmaceutical industry uses for drug absorption. 
Um, but what happens in this gut on a chip is the, the morphology and the physiology changes dramatically, as I'll, I'll show you. Um, but in addition, uh, we're also using human primary biopsies from uh, area hospitals to start to develop uh, human primary cells uh, in the same uh, organ system. So one of the first things that you noticed over the course of several days is there were, the cells started to pile up on each other or build up. And actually what they were doing were building villi-like structure. So just in response to the flow and the stretch, these were trying to recreate uh, self-assemble into villi-like structure that you see in your normal gut. And so here's just a high-resolution cross-section where you can see the, the villi-like tip as well as the crypt-like regions uh, in our chip. And you can see the brush border uh, microvilli here in a higher magnification uh, image. Now again, these aren't villi, they're villi-like structures. And part of that physiology is that in the, in, in the gut, the crypt level is where the stem cells reside, that's where the proliferative cells reside, um, and as they differentiate, the, the cells migrate up towards the tip, they differentiate into different cell types, and then eventually apoptose and die and slough off at the tips of the villi. So we wanted to see where the proliferative cells were uh, in our uh, organ on a chip uh, villi. And so uh, Hyun did an EDU pulse chase experiment, uh, which labels the proliferative cells. And to our great surprise, they were actually forming. Uh, the proliferative cells were actually down here at the crypt level, just as you'd expect uh, in, a, uh, in a human gut. And over the course of 24 hours, those cells then migrated up toward the tip of the villi. And this just gives a uh, quick overview of some of the parameters that are uh, differentiated and um, the gut on the chip. And so you can see the barrier function is much better than they do in transwall cultures. We have better differentiation with markers such as aminopeptidase. Uh, we actually start to see reestablishment of drug metabolizing enzymes. So usually in KCO2 cells, there's very few, there's very little or negligible amounts of uh, 3A4, which is a specific drug metabolism enzyme. Uh, with the gut on a chip, we actually see a dramatic increase in the levels of those enzymes over several days in culture. Um, again, uh, the caveat here is that those levels are nowhere near what uh, you'd expect in normal physiology, but we're actually seeing an improvement over time. In addition, we're seeing mucus production in these chips. KCO2 cells don't normally produce a lot of mucus, and so in this case, the darker uh, blue indicates more uh, production of actual mucus, and you can see that occurs over several days. And so one of the key things that uh, we wanted to recreate with this flow was actually could we uh, co-culture with the human microbiome. And so initially, uh, Hyun uh, co-cultured uh, lactobacillus G with uh, the KCO2 cells and applying just the right amount of seeding of the, the bacteria as well as adding the uh, fluidic flow, really we're able to keep these in co-culture. And so up here in... Um, uh, the top panel here, you can see that if you just do this in a trans well, basically the permeability barrier, the barrier function goes away within 24 hours. Uh, basically, if anybody in the room has done tissue culture, that's called contamination, and your mammalian cells basically die. Uh, with the uh, fluidic flow through the top channel, as well as uh, the seeding, we can actually maintain that for up to 14 days now, I think is what uh, Hyun has done the co-culture for. And in fact, if you look at the permeability barrier with and without the probiotic uh, lactobacillus G, you can see that there's actually an increase in the permeability barrier uh, tightening, which is uh, what you'd expect from in vivo studies with uh, probiotic bacteria. He's since extended that to look at uh, mixtures of probiotic bacteria. V VSL3 is a mixture of eight different probiotics, and they seem to form colonies within the uh, crypt-like regions between the villi. Uh, in fact, he's actually gone further now to look at pathogenic uh, E. coli in these, in these systems and uh, done some interesting responses uh, with disease models and inflammatory responses. So one of the key, uh, I just want to, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but just wanted to show some of the differences that occur with the trans wells. And so this is using JEDI, which is a transcriptome analysis visualization tool uh, developed by Don Ingber's lab. Um, it can look at 23 different uh, transcriptomes. And so basically, just looking visually, you can see that uh, st static transwall culture and the gut on a chip were actually adding the shear and the, uh, the strain. The genetic signatures are totally different. And so basically, the take-home message is the cells that you put in initially are totally different than the cells that you see several days later, phenotypically uh, and uh, genotypically. 
and physiologically and functionally. In addition, if you add the bacteria and co-culture, again, you see this is from the mammalian cells, not from the bacterial cells. Again, there's a symbiotic relationship, and you can change the genomic signature of these uh, systems. And so the applications, you can imagine, you can utilize these for drug transport studies, nutrient transport studies, the effects of the microbiome, as well as developing disease models such as Crohn's disease and IBD. And then the last chip I'll tell you is a little bit different structure. It's a little bit simpler. Uh, it's the bone marrow in a chip, and this was just published uh, a few months ago by Yusuke Torosal and Katie Spina. And basically, it's a small PDMS device. It's closed off at one end. Uh, in the chamber, uh, the cylindrical chamber, we put bone-inducing material, DMP, or demineralized uh, bone powder and uh, BMPs. Uh, those are sutured next to the uh, skeletal muscle of a mouse, uh, left in there for up to eight weeks, and they start to form uh, engineered bone marrow. Uh, then we can take those out, put those into a microfluidic device, and maintain those in culture for up to seven days. So now you can imagine that you can actually do some interesting uh, manipulations and testing in that in vitro uh, microfluidic device. Again, this just uh, shows the evolution of the device over time. So at four weeks in culture, you can see there's actually bone formation uh, that's occurring in the, in the cylinder, and you're starting to see what looks like bone marrow formation, this uh, slight red color here. After about eight weeks, uh, you get a much darker, deep red color and really uh, giving an indication there might be uh, bone marrow formation occurring uh, within this device. Uh, once you take it out and do histological sections and uh, micro-CT, you can see here that we're actually forming uh, both cortical bone as well as trabecular bone uh, within the engineered bone marrow chip. And we're also forming this cortical layer, and then you look at high-resolution uh, microscopy and H&E stain. We're actually looking at something that looks very similar to uh, endogenous bone marrow of the mouse. And if you compare uh, the engineered bone marrow at eight weeks with the mouse, uh, his own native uh, femur and the marrow, you can see that they're very similar in structure. Our engineered bone marrow is actually, chip is actually a little bit larger in size. And again, if you look at high resolution uh, images, uh, they're virtually identical. If you do a little more, uh, characterization, you use fax analysis to look at the different uh, populations of cells that are uh, resident within the engineered bone marrow and compare that to the mouse endogenous bone marrow. You can see this is uh, mouse peripheral blood, this is the mouse uh, endogenous bone marrow, that at eight weeks we're starting to approach the populations that you'd normally see in the, in the mouse uh, bone marrow, and at eight weeks uh, they're virtually identical. Same for the uh, differentiated uh, blood distribution cell types. So they're virtually identical at about eight weeks. And now with the in vitro culture, uh, we can actually take those now out of the, uh, the, uh, the mouse and then put them into a, a microfluidic device. We can compare those to 2D dextro culture, which is kind of the gold standard now, where you uh, culture the bone marrow cells on a 2D stromal feeder layer. Here we take the bone marrow chip out. The viability is uh, roughly the same uh, between the dextro culture and the engineered bone marrow, up to seven days. Where the key differences occur is uh, with the uh, hemopoietic stem cells and the progenitor cells, in dexter culture, you actually start to lose the, the stem cell population. They start to differentiate and expand, where we're able to maintain those in our engineered bone marrow because we've actually formed the appropriate microenvironment in the, uh, home, the stem cell uh, niche. Uh, the, the small ones, the very, the, the, uh, yeah, the right at the bottom, yeah. And so you can, uh, the, the, the graph on the right just basically says you can uh, maintain these uh, better than the, uh, the dexter culture over time. Uh, the other a key advantage in recreating that uh, microenvironment is you don't need to add back exogenous cytokines. The cells are actually producing the appropriate cytokines themselves, and so you don't need to add those back. And then lastly, to show that those bone marrow cells were actually functional, uh, the, uh, the key experiment is to take the uh, bone marrow that was in the microfluidic di uh, device for up to seven days. Uh, in this case, we'll look at four days. Um, it lethally irradiated a mouse, take the bone marrow out of the engineered chip and put it back into the lethally irradiated mouse and see if we can reconstitute uh, the bone marrow in that mouse. 
And so to do that experiment, we generated the bone marrow, engineered bone marrow from a GFP uh, fluorescent mouse, so we can uh, know which cells those uh, uh, came from the, uh, the engineered bone marrow, and put those into a non-GFP loosely rated mouse. And so you can look at the engraftment. So after six weeks, we get, still get good engraftment of the GFP cells into the uh, lethally irrated mouse. And basically says the progenitor cells were resonant in our engineered bone marrow chip for up to four days. And after 16 weeks, we still get good engraftment in the mouse. And basically that says that our hemopoietic stem cell population was viable uh, for up to at least four days. And in, uh, uh, Yusuke has actually extended that out to seven days uh, in culture in the chip. And this just shows that the distribution of the uh, different myeloid cells and differentiated cell types are uh, present in the appropriate uh, levels also. Uh, we just recently got a grant from the FDA uh, to develop medical countermeasures against acute radiation syndrome. And so they're very interested in our gut chip as well as our uh, bone marrow chip. And so we started to do some preliminary studies with uh, irradiating the chips and see if we can get uh, an appropriate response. Um, so you can see here the, uh, if I can get my pointer to go here. Well, the in vivo is uh, the dark uh, engineered bone marrow in the Dexter culture. And basically, uh, lo looking at radiation levels at one and four gray, you can see that the engineered bone marrow much uh, better mimics the in vivo response than the Dexter culture. The Dexter culture tends to be much more insensitive uh, to radiation. And GCSF uh, is a, a medical counter, potential medical countermeasure uh, used as a radiation mitigator, so it should increase the population of hemopoietic stem cells, and indeed that does in our chip. So after either one gray or four gray uh, radiation, we can stimulate uh, the hemopoietic stem cell population with GCSF. And so this gives us really good confidence that we think we can develop these organ systems to look at uh, uh, an area where it's unethical to do uh, evaluations on clinical populations, so you really need to use the animal rule. Animal aren't, uh, animals aren't always very predictive of the human response, and so now we can look at uh, human-based organ systems to look at medical countermeasures development. And so uh, as part of a large DARPA grant, the idea is we can start to interlink all of these systems together, uh, the lung alveolus, heart, lung, small uh, intestine, large intestine. We're developing at least 15 different organs within the VEAS currently. Uh, they're at various stages of development. Some are much farther along than others. Um, but the idea is to eventually link these together, keep them alive uh, for up to a month. To do that, we're developing an instrument. Um, and this is kind of an artist rendition of that instrument, uh, as well as the different components uh, here on the uh, right. And so at the top, you can see the uh, chip. So you can actually have an individual organ chip that's specified and uh, tailored to that specific organ. That's put into a universal chip holder. And so basically, that applies all the interfaces and links that you need to the inner instrument. And then you can just use that in a plug and, uh, plug and play uh, manner and basically click in the organ systems that you want and interlink them in any way that you want. And at the bottom left, you can see is kind of our initial prototype. We've made a lot of progress within the last 18 months in developing prototypes. And so we have a system now that can put on uh, 12 different organ chips. It has a uh, microscope on a rail that can uh, do three-color uh, fluorescent microscopy, as well as perfusion and interlinking of the chips. And uh, Kyle will actually go into much more greater detail in the next talk, but you know, the potential of IPS cells now is we can actually individualize these chips, so we could potentially make a human organ system based on you or I, as well as populations of people. And so can we look at different haplotypes uh, different responders, uh, excretors uh, to these cells. And potentially, could we do clinical trials on chips of different subpopulations of patients? So this is our website. I encourage you to go there and list, uh, read more about what we're doing at the VEAS, as well as the different organ systems. And this is the team. You can imagine it takes a very large team to do this work of both engineers, bio biologists, software, physiologists, and clinicians. And so with that, I'll end the talk. Thank you so much, Tony. Oh, okay. <laughs> Morning, Tony. Um, 
your introductory slide, I, I always love it because you lay out very clearly the things that are necessary and sufficient for you to get the, the, the interface function that you're looking at. And I find it interesting that the, immuno, the immune system is in there because obviously that is really important for the pathophysiology, mm -hmm. but the nervous system is not. And is that an intentional omission because that's sort of like an organ control versus interfacial, or could you elaborate on that a little bit? No, it's it's just that we've, uh, as I as I pointed out in the in the in the opening, really tried to simplify the system and start simple. And so obviously we're we're thinking about ways to integrate the uh, the nervous system. Uh, for example, Kit Parker is looking at ways he's developing a skeletal muscle on a chip to integrate the uh, the nervous the motor neurons in there because that's key to to normal physiology and function. It's it's not as easy uh, to do that, to especially interlinking physiologically relevant ways. Uh, the nervous system, but we're obviously very interested in doing that. Um, you know, we haven't done, uh, you know, a brain on a chip yet because uh, I think that's uh, a very high level, but we have done started to do things like a blood-brain barrier on a chip. And so we're moving in that direction. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think to integrate, uh, you know, either nervous system function, uh, especially with the neurotrophic factors that you, you might secrete there, uh, but also the stimulatory factors and patterns. Uh, there are other ways that we could potentially do that, say with optogenetics, actually stimulate things like neuroendocrine cells or beta cells or muscle. But again, that neurotrophic factor would be missing there. So I think a uh, long way to go, uh, you know, there's a ways to go, but I think we're going to start moving that direction. So thank you, Tony. This was very inspiring, and I'm glad to see that cell biologists are thinking of putting themselves on the, on the brain on the chip. Uh, I can be pretty certain that our next speaker and myself as card-carrying toxicologists uh, will never see ourselves on the chip and uh, not thus being replaced. So our next <laughs> speaker is uh, Kyle Collagey, who's uh, a card-carrying toxicologist, has a PhD from Indiana University, and then uh, very good training, I'm sure, from Kansas University in toxicology, and has been around pharma uh, for a very long time, leading uh, a number of uh, uh, high-profile um, screening and, and toxicity testing efforts and was not afraid to be one of the first toxicologists to start using stem cells and he is now paying for it by uh, working for Cellular Dynamics International. So, Kyle.